I often find that pathologists are a bit up against it when you're talking to uh, non-pathologists because you have to explain the terminology. But one of the things I want to do today is tell you a little, about, a little bit about the various morphologic variants there are of prostate cancer. Because one of the things that's been talked about today is prostate cancer. But prostate cancer isn't just prostate cancer, there's lots of sorts of prostate cancer. And unless you understand that, then you won't understand how to treat some of the more aggressive forms appropriately. So in 2016, we had a meeting of the World Health Organization Tumor Classification Panel, of which I'm on the prostate and kidney group, and we decided that there were a number of variants of asina adenocarcinoma which appeared different and behaved differently than the typical form. And I'm going to go through these uh, reasonably quickly today, but before I do that, uh, I should also say there were some other forms which were not related to asinocarcinoma, but, sh but are reasonably readily diagnosed, especially the ductal form, and I want to explain a little bit about that as well. But before I do that, I want to talk a little bit about asina adenocarcinoma so we are all on the same page and we know what we're talking about. The prostate gland is a glandular organ and it has at the periphery lobules and the lobules make the secretions, they come into the central part of the prostate and are carried out of the prostate by ducts. Now when we talk about asinocarcinoma, we're talking about the tumours that arise from the lobules or at the periphery of the gland. They come from the lining cells of the gland and there are numerous patterns. Some patterns can occur together, and it, it was originally determined by Donald Gleason that there were five patterns, although this is now abandoned. This is a typical low-grade pattern, which we would call Gleason pattern three, or now grade one. This patient would qualify for active surveillance. As indeed with this, you'll notice that the glands themselves are well circumscribed, and they recapitulate the adult tissues. So it's a well-differentiated carcinoma. As we go down the spectrum to more aggressive tumours, then things are starting to go awry. Instead of the glands being separate, they no longer separate, and so you're getting proliferations and bubbling of glands to form laciform structures. And this is known as cribriform glands, and this is what we call Gleason pattern four, or in combination, ISUP grades two or three or four, depending on the proportions. This is a, a tumor which has a lot of cribriform glanding, and this is an aggressive tumor which would grow quickly. You know that this patient is likely not to have a, a favorable prognosis as one where the glands are well developed, and in such cases, this patient would rarely be considered for active surveillance, and the thing that would perhaps control that is that uh, there was a low volume tumor. Another form of poorly formed gland is when the glands themselves just form little solid nests where you can barely discern the asinus. And that is a poorly formed gland which is by definition included with the cribriform gland. So this is an aggressive tumor, and perhaps the most aggressive form of all is that the tumor forms these cribriform areas, but it happens so quickly that the blood supply doesn't develop, and so the central part of the tumor dies. The technical term for that is it undergoes necrosis, and where you see necrosis, then you know you've got an aggressive tumor which is growing very quickly. And you may recall a couple of years ago I gave you a talk on grading of tumors, and we talked about Gleason's work, and this was the original drawing from Donald Gleason, which is now over 50 years old. And he, let's just neglect the last two, because I, as I explained to you with the new grading system, uh, these aren't tumors anymore. These are considered proliferative lesions. But we have his three main grades with the various patterns that I've explained to you, and they make up the Gleason grading system. And this is the uh, diagram that is, I think, well known to everybody, uh, where one and two are no longer considered tumors, but three, four, and five, and the, they're added together to make the score which ranges between six and 10 with increasing malignancy and increasing aggressive behavior. So just to recapitulate, here are the Gleason scores which are entirely based on the morphology. Uh, the lowest is six, 
the highest is 10, and as you go up the uh, numerical order, then you have increasing malignancy. Now, that really isn't particularly favourable, as we've talked about before, because you're saying someone with a Gleason 6 tumour, 6 out of 10, has a very low-grade uh, disease. And so, for that reason, we decided to take the bull by the horns and regrade uh, prostate cancer into five grades, which do correlate roughly with Gleason scores, but in fact, you can see we've dropped uh, Gleason scores uh, two to five entirely and start off with grade one, which is 336. Grade two is a very important score, as is grade three, because it's in dependent entirely on the proportion of pattern four, that's the cribriform or the pauliform glands that are present, and that really does determine uh, outcomes specifically. And a lot of work is being undertaken to work out if the proportion itself is worth measuring. And this is one of the uh, clinical trials that we've had on this new grading system, and quite frankly, if you are going to make up a survival curve, uh, you would make up a curve that looks like this because it's virtually perfect. It stratifies the three grades. This is uh, outcome along here, and this is the grade here, a probability in the, the various grades. So if you're grade one, you do well. If you're grade five, you do not so well. And so that's the purpose of a grading system. It predicts outcome and it gives the clinician an idea how to treat a potentially indolent or a potentially aggressive tumour. So that's ordinary acinocarcinoma, and I just wanted to recapitulate the grading system and give you an idea of the patterns, because the ones I'm going to show you now are quite different. The first is called atrophic carcinoma, and it's a sort of a bit of a misnomer, isn't it? Because it's a cancer that looks as though it's involuting, and it's one of the morphologies that you see in benign nodular hyperplasia. Because while one in nine men get prostate cancer, virtually every man gets benign nodular hyperplasia. It's part of the growing old process, and it's part of the problem that's responsible for the long line of queues outside the toilets in picture theatres, because as you get older, it takes you longer to pee. And the reason for that is because the prostate gets bigger. And part of that is that you get hyperplasia, which means that the gland actually proliferates. But while that's occurring, another part of the gland is involuting, and that's what we call atrophy. And that's exactly what we see in many patients who've got benign nodular hyperplasia. It's of no pathologic consequence whatsoever. But the only real problem is that this cancer mimics it. And so we have tumours where there's a paucity of cytoplasm, they have a small amount of the, the, the substance around the nucleus, and that's quite typical of an atrophic gland. It is unusual, but it's mixed in with, often with a typical acinar adenocarcinoma, and as we learned earlier on today, biopsies pretty much hit and miss, and you just might nick, or the urologist just might nick, an, an atrophic carcinoma, and an pathologist who's unaware of it would say, oh, this is atrophy, this is benign, not a problem at all. And a cancer's been missed, and an opportunity has been missed. It is well differentiated, and by definition, it's called ISUP grade one. So if it's all that's in the prostate, then the patient will almost certainly uh, receive active surveillance. But it can occur in higher grades, and if it does, then it is treated according to the higher grade. So it is grade dependent, while most of it is usually ISU P grade one. This is what it looks like. These are little glands which you could, under low power, mistake for uh, atrophic glands. Under this power, I would say no pathologist in their right mind would call that benign or that. Now the reason I say that is because if you see the little nuclei, these are these pale areas, in the middle of them, they've got little pink things, and these pink things are nucleoli, which are structures which are responsible for protein production. And in prostate cancer, nucleolar prominence is one of the most important diagnostic tools. So it just emphasizes to the pathologist, if you see atrophic areas, don't forget to look for the nucleoli, because if you do, you're going to miss uh, an atrophic carcinoma. And here it is under high power, and you can see these nucleoli are very prominent. And truly there's no real excuse for calling this 
benign because it's got all the features of malignancy. And there are other tests that we can do to confirm that. But it, it is an interesting cancer, and it is one which is occasionally overlooked because it morphologically mimics, mimics a benign process. Now, at the other end of that, we have cancers that look as though they're going mad in a benign way because benign nodular hyperplasia of the prostate is a proliferation of the stroma, that's the supporting structure, and the glandular structures. And it's, it, it occurs because as the prostate gets older, it starts to concentrate testosterone, and that causes the, the prostate to drive growth. And so you get these large prostates in older men, and one of the typical features of that is prostatic hyperplasia. So, it mimics benign hyperplasia. It can be nodular, just as benign nodular hyperplasia is. It's often associated with typical acinocarcinoma, as are indeed many of these. It has a good prognosis, and by definition, it's called grade one. So what does it look like? Well, it looks like this. And this really does look like benign nodular hyperplasia of the prostate. If you looked at this casually, you would think, oh, this is a benign process, not, not a problem at all. And here's a bit more, and you can see this really, again, looks pretty benign until you start to look for the nucleoli and you can see them because these are the big giveaways for these mimicking processes where you've got apparently benign disease, which in fact is malignant. And here again is another example, and, and perhaps one thing that would make you a little bit worried as a pathologist, and I'm not trying to turn you into pathologists, heaven forbid, I find it hard enough and I've been doing it a few years, is... Um, that you, you have a rather blue look to the whole thing, and that is a, a pretty much a giveaway that you've got a malignancy uh, when you're getting what's called hyperchromatism, too much nuclear protein. And finally, um, here is a slide which I hope will convince you that you can see the nucleoli, and um, they are obvious to be seen and, and, and easily dis discerned. So the diagnosis should not be overlooked. Now, there is another form of cancer which is relatively indolent, and that's foamy gland cancer. This is an interesting uh, cancer because most cancers have foamy glands in them. Pathologists love all these descriptive terms. Foamy means that the, the cytoplasm, the, the, the material that sound, surrounds the nucleus looks bubbly. So, it's found in about 30% of tumours, although it's rare on its own. The nuclei are often small, and that is a problem, because the nuclei really don't look malignant. It's commonly seen in intermediate grade tumours, and the outcome is stratified by grade. So it's, it's a, just a variant of an acinocarcinoma, and this is what it looks like. You see, instead of it, the, the cytoplasm having this rather pink look up here, it's got this rather pale, flocculent look and the nuclei in the cells are not particularly pleomorphic. We look for other things and we can use special stains to make the diagnosis, but you just have to be aware that the lesion exists. And here we have, under high power, um, the nucleoli aren't particularly prominent. We're really struggling to find them. There's one there. Uh, but the, the actual blueness of the nucleus itself uh, masks the nucleoli. So this, is a, this can be a problem for... A, a, from a diagnostic point of view, and it's one where the pathologist has to be aware that the tumour exists. If you don't know it exists, you're going to miss it. Uh, fortunately, we do teach our pathologists reasonably well in this country, I'm pleased to say. Now, they're the good ones to have. There are some others which are bad ones to have, and it's important that we recognise them so the patients can get appropriate and aggressive treatment. One of these is signet ring cell-like carcinoma. And Pathologists either give, give diseases food-type names, like oat cell carcinoma of the lung, or fashion-type names, like signet ring cell carcinoma. And the reason they're called signet ring cell carcinomas is the nucleus sits to one side and the cell is full of mucin, like a signet ring, and the nucleus looks like the stone in a signet ring, and I'll explain that in a minute. So these have vacuoles, but they don't have discernible mucin in them. The mucin doesn't stain. Uh, for the diagnosis to be made, there has to be a lot of this uh, structure. 
This is a very high grade cancer, which by definition is grade five and has an aggressive clinical course. So this is a patient you would not put on active surveillance. It's a patient you might not even consider radical prostatectomy for because you're going to do the appropriate scanning studies and find this extra prostatic disease. Here is a signet ring cell carcinoma. You see what I mean? There's the signet ring. You can see the stone and the mucin, which is pale and really not visible. And that's the typical structure. They're forming nests. They're forming individual cells. Therefore, by definition, they're Gleason pattern 5, ISUP grade 5, i.e. Gleason score 5 plus 5 equals 10. Another tumour pretty much akin to this is pleomorphic giant cell carcinoma. And by the end of this lecture, you'll have all the pathology terminology you're ever going to need. These are rare tumours. They're roughly about the same age as prostate cancer at their time of, of diagnosis. They're often associated with high-grade tumours. And there may be a history of previous radiotherapy or hormone therapy, but often they occur de novo, that is, they occur on their own. They have an aggressive clinical behaviour. Now, what does pleomorphic giant cell carcinoma mean? Well, pleomorphic is a term we use when the nucleus doesn't have a nice round form, it's irregular, it stains blue, it looks nasty. Pathologists say, oh, that's nasty, and that means it's pleomorphic. And let's just go to the next slide, and that is a classic pleomorphic nucleus. See, there's an ordinary little old nucleus, and here's a big one with a prominent nucleolus. And what happens is the nucleus undergoes mitosis, that means it reproduces, but it doesn't split up. Sp sometimes it splits up, and so you have lots of nuclei in the same cell, and that's a, the term we use for that is a giant cell. So if you've got lots of nuclei in the same cell and big, nasty-looking nuclei, you've got a pleomorphic giant cell carcinoma. And anything that's pleomorphic and anything that's giant cell in pathology has an aggressive behaviour. It can't undergo mitosis, it can't reproduce properly, it's undergoing abnormal mitosis. It does that because it reproduces so quickly that it just doesn't have time to finish off the process. So giant cell tumours are aggressive tumours and these tumours behave in an aggressive manner. Another of the nasty uh, components of uh, acinocarcinoma are sarcomatoid cancers. Now, an adenocarcinoma is an epithelial cancer. That's a cancer of the lining cells of tissues. Bowel cancer is an epithelial cancer. Cancer of the muscle is a sarcoma. It's not really a cancer, it's a sarcoma. It's, that's a stromal tumour. So if you have an epithelial tumour, it has a certain look. If you have a stromal tumour, it has a certain look. Just to complicate matters, very aggressive tumours that don't reproduce uh, properly, but reproduce in a very quick way or a rapid manner, uh, start to recapitulate sarcomas. They look like stromal tissue. And where you have that, it's called sarcomatoid carcinoma. And the interesting thing is that the epithelium and the mesenchyme uh, that you see is all derived from the same tissue. So they're originally epithelial and they've just de-differentiated in an aggressive manner because the genetics are absolutely the same. It's seen in older men, uh, may have had a history of radiotherapy or hormone therapy in the past. It has very aggressive clinical behaviour and this is what it looks like. It's just spindle cells and that's what a, a muscle tumour looks like and you're really struggling to see any epithelial or duct lining component. There's a little bit here, a little bit here and um, well if I said I could see some I think I've probably oh, a little bit up there but there's not a lot. This is a, a very aggressive tumour. These patients will not do well and again active surveillance is something that you would never consider. Mucinous carcinoma is interesting. It has a good prognosis, and uh, it's not really been understood whether this form of acinocarcinoma has a better prognosis or a worse prognosis. And uh, if we go back and look at the history, it's quite fascinating. First of all, let's define it. It's mucin, which means it's producing uh, slimy material uh, in more than 25% of the tumour. On its own, it's rare, but most tumours have a bit of it. And at the moment, we've graded according to the underlying architecture. We've just done a study, which I just thought I'd share with you. This is a mucinous tumour. You have leakage of the mucin. Here's the tumour here, and leakage of the mucin through the acinus. Here is another one, and this is obviously a low-grade one because it's got the glands. 
but you can see that there is leakage of the tumour into the stroma, the connective tissue. Another one, uh, this is a higher grade tumour, it's got our uh, cribriform areas, and you can see that there's a lot of mucin. Do all these behave the same or do they behave differently? Again, crib reform, but it doesn't look as nasty as the previous one. It's got these long, lacy form areas, which sort of give it a, an indolent appearance. And here's another crib reform one, which is much more aggressive because the tumour cells themselves are, have the ability to crowd over on each other. And finally, uh, a, a pattern five, where you've got individual uh, cells in mucin. So that's obviously a high-grade tumour. So one of the issues we've had is that there have been a lot of conflicting studies. Epstein said, oh, well, look, this is an aggressive tumour, often associated with bony metastases, six cases. Uh, Jay Rowe from Korea said bony metastases is common. But Austin Coyer uh, from the United States says, no, this has a much better prognosis. So what does the clinician do? Do they treat the patient aggressively? Do they give them palliative care? And that was what we set about trying to find out. So we had a series of 143 patients who had undergone radical prostatectomy with this tumour, and 73% of the cases had uh, greater than 25%, 70% under 25%, and then we graded them and matched them with control cases which were non-mucinous. And the interesting thing we found was that between the groups, that's the, the greater than 25, the less than 25% mucin, and the no mucin, that the serum PSA of the patients was the same, the tumour volume was the same, the amount of extra prostatic extension, that is tumour spreading beyond the prostate, was the same. Surgical margin positivity, um, that is how successful the operation was, if you like, uh, and which is a marker of tumour aggression, progression, aggression was the same. And the recurrence rate, which is a surrogate marker of outcome, was the same. So the conclusion was that the presence or the percentage of a mucinous component in prostate cancer has absolutely no impact whatsoever, and so you need to treat patients with this disease exactly the same as you would adenocarcinoma. And I think that that's a step forward because that was a question that hadn't been answered for the past 20 years. Now, we've got a couple of other rare tumours that I thought I'd discuss with you, and you have to go... We, another anatomy lesson, I'm afraid. The ducts and lobules of the prostate gland have acinar lining, but beyond that they have what are called basal cells, and the basal cells themselves can become malignant, and aggressively so. Um, again, it presents at roughly the same age as an acinar carcinoma, but interestingly, it is PSA negative, and that's why we must do this, because there are a number of tumours that are PSA negative. And this is what it looks like. It's just nests of basal cells that can uh, look quite aggressive, spread through the stroma, or they can form rather indolent looking nests which look benign. But these are aggressive tumours and need to be treated aggressively. And finally, I'm going to talk to you about ductal carcinoma. Because the lobules are the acinar carcinoma, but the ducts which take in the secretions are the ductal carcinoma. And so these tumours arise in the prostatic ducts, and they say about 3.2% of prostate cancers are ductal carcinomas. They're often mixed with other carcinomas, and they have a typical architecture. They look like bladder cancer, and they have elongate nuclei, which is quite typical. Uh, at the moment, they're graded as ISUP grade 4. They're considered high-grade uh, cancers, and the reason for that comes from a study. Now, this is bladder cancer bladder cancer, ductal adenocarcinoma of the prostate, ductal adenocarcinoma of the prostate, you can see that the nuclei are long. They look identical, and they can form nests just like bladder cancer. And we looked at uh, 268 radical prostatectomy specimens and found 34 cases of ductal carcinoma in them. And we showed that only the presence of ductal carcinoma rather than the percentage of ductal carcinoma predicted how the tumour would behave. Now, we set about saying, OK, can we prove it's like acinar carcinoma in its behaviour? And so we did some genetic studies. We looked at 11 cases and looked at 655 genes and correlated that outcome with the genes from matched libraries of acinar carcinoma. And I'll just show you, here's the genes here. 
and these are the 11 cases across here, and the different colours measure different levels of positivity, and you can see that there are certain patterns and the genes are actually uh, arranged in various metabolic pathways which make it easier to interpret them. And the upshot was that the copy numbers of the 11 cases matched almost identically those seen in high grade ISUP grade 4 or Gleason 448 asana carcinoma. And so the study showed that really there was very good reason for treating these as aggressive tumours because they have the genetic signature of aggressive tumours. And finally, I just want to say that cancer variants are far less common than the typical variant, but they do behave in different ways than the typical variant and need to be taken into account. They're often associated with aggressive disease, they may present with an extra prostatic spread, and they may not uh, express PSA. And so I just uh, leave you with the thoughts of my co-patron, Sir Peter Leach.